You're listening to a sermon from the Spring Midtown Church in Phoenix, Arizona. If you'd like to learn more about the Spring and its ministry, please visit thespringmidtown.org or follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Let me encourage you to turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 3. I'm going to open real Bibles if you got them, cell phones if you got them. Nehemiah 3.28, we're continuing in our series that we're calling Hashtag Here, Now, Us. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to get back into this story. For those of you who are just joining us, the book of Nehemiah comes just before the book of Job and Psalms, uh, and is the amazing story of uh, some people who are truly us. So Nehemiah 3, starting at verse 28. Above the horse gate, the priests made repairs each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. After him, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. After him, Meshelam, son of Berechiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate and the upper room of the corner. And between the upper room of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. We'll stop there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Leave a finger or a bookmark in there. 18,038. That is the number of pieces in what is arguably the world's most recognizable piece of art. It was also one of the tallest buildings on earth at one point in time. And by some definitions, is also the biggest jigsaw puzzle ever created by human beings. It required a lot of different people to put together with thousands and thousands of pieces. Uh, Hundreds of riveters, scientists, mathematicians, engineers, not to mention a specially trained team of acrobats who walked the beams. And yet, despite all of this teamwork, you and I only really know it by the name of its designer, Alexander Gustav Eiffel. Because that's how we say that name in English, Eiffel. Uh, This is the Eiffel Tower, which, uh, honestly, most people didn't think would even get built. It was widely derided as artless, useless, completely pointless, badly designed, and unnecessary. Uh, Not to mention other really impolite words that the French said about it at the time. None of them really wanted to build it. Uh, In 1909, the city of Paris seriously considered tearing it down. And they didn't, by a narrow margin. Uh, This thing that you and I know of is a huge tourist attraction that brings millions of dollars to Paris every year. People just didn't see the value of it. There were lots of naysayers at the time. And so you might think that this is a monument to Eiffel, but actually he knew that there were people who were with him and there were people who were against him. And he had inscribed on the tower all the names of all of the people who helped him get it done. The mathematicians, the scientists, the folks. He said, I stood on their shoulders. It's not a monument to Eiffel, but to a team of people who were unstoppable. That's what's going on in this chapter of the book of Nehemiah. I know it's really frustrating sometimes to come across a list of names and places in the Bible. They sound weirdly Semitic. You don't really have a map to know what's going on. You don't know who these people are or anything about their story. And why anyone would bother listing them is beyond you. But to Nehemiah, these aren't names. Not just names, anyway. These are people who stepped up. These are people who got in the game. These are people who started to build when the odds were against them, when people were against them, when it was difficult, if not impossible. These were the people who focused on what was in front of them and started to build. Hundreds of years from now, if this church still exists and you and I are all dead, no one will know, really, who these people are, if we listed all the names on these Zoom calls or all the names of the folks who are connected to our church. But I would know, and you would know. We would know what the faces looked like. We'd know how they were involved. We'd know how they served. Because you and I are building something together. That's that's what the church is, something that you and I do together, a community of people that slowly and steadily is trying to bring the kingdom of God. And each of us does it, the beauty of Zoom, by focusing on the thing that's right in front of us, on our box, Uh, the thing that, well, we're actually able to affect. 
In the United States of America, we have, uh, well, let's just say, a, a lot of ruins. The world is in shambles. Things are falling down. Stuff that we thought of as uh, pretty secure and stable uh, it seems to be falling apart. And at this point, honestly, many of us are just exhausted by the reality of COVID, are slowly coming to the realization that it's not going away anytime soon, and that our lives have sort of fundamentally changed, and we're not quite sure what to do or how to go forward or, or what we can really accomplish in a season like this. And then, you know, you watch the news and you hear about just how bad it's going to get, how it's actually going to be so much worse in China and all these things that might be going on. And, and if you just start scrolling through your phone, people call that group doom scrolling at this point, right? Because you're just finding out what new doom awaits us in the next possible swipe of your thumb. And so in a situation like that, we, we're tempted to say, well, you know whose problem this is? It's the elected officials or it's, it's the smart scientists out there without names or faces. It's, it's those people. They need to figure this out for us. And we tend to think that this problem is so big, it's so far beyond us, just like the people in Nehemiah's day who are looking at a wall that's been torn down, a city that's been torn down, and saying, man, I don't know who's going to fix this. And that's when Nehemiah steps up and says, yeah, here, now, us. That's who it's going to be. It's going to be you, it's going to be me, because if it's not us, then when and where is this ever going to happen? Who's actually going to step up and solve this problem? And you and I really can't do anything about what the governor is doing or the state of Arizona health department's doing or what the U.S. government is doing. We have no control over those things beyond voting. But what we can do is we can wear a mask at the grocery store. We can minimize risk. And we can use wisdom. And we can love people even when that might be dangerous from time to time. We can invite people into our circles who wouldn't ordinarily be in our circles and not just conceive of that as a virus risk, but a way to love our neighbor as well in the name of Jesus. We can look at the, the problems of racial injustice in our time and go, man, this is it's too huge. It's so far beyond what, what I can even figure out, the problems and the, the history of it. And it, I just don't even know what to do or where to begin. And again, you're tempted to maybe think that some middleman somewhere else is supposed to figure this out for us. But the truth is you can control what's right in front of you. You can advocate for people of color in your life. You can be somebody who makes a difference in the lives of the people around you. You can show up to your office. You can show up in your neighborhood. You can pay attention to what's going on around you. And we can be people who deal with what's right in front of us, who build brick by brick exactly the way that people do in this story. Again, the problems around us are immense and ridiculous. The economic struggles we're dealing with, the, the reality of a changed world in the time of our lives, and the fact that there are so many people who are hopeless and in despair and don't really seem to know Jesus. We go, maybe the church will figure that. Maybe there's some middleman out there somewhere else that will figure that out for me. And the truth is that here and now, God is calling us. God is calling us to be unstoppable. To be people who bear witness. And bear witness right in front of us. Right? We got three houses in front of you. You got two houses on your right and your left. You got three houses behind you. If life were a hashtag and you're right in the middle, you're surrounded by at least eight households, probably, in your neighborhood. If you're in an apartment complex, that might not fit, so maybe it's your whole hall of people. But there are people in our lives who are right in front of us, who we can serve and who we can love in the name of Jesus. We can figure out all sorts of different ways, actually, to take care of the elderly folks around us, to do what we can to love our families and our friends, but also strangers and the homeless and the poor. We can tithe to the local church. We can get invested in Hope Women's Center just down the way from us, our partners in ministry. And so many of you have already been doing that. People are donating diapers who don't even have children. You've gone out in a diaper shortage to find diapers in order to give them away to people who don't have the luxury of social distancing and don't have the luxury of driving to six stores to try and find items that they need. And it's one of the reasons we're so excited to partner with these people because we want to love our neighbors. We know that in this really difficult season that you and I can be unstoppable. And that starts really just by focusing on what's in front of us. The people in this story are not masons. Of all of the professions you hear, you don't hear structural engineer or really good at putting rocks together with masonry. They are priests and prophets and goldsmiths and merchants and insurance salesmen and second grade teachers and admissions officials at a local college and therapists and pastors and, well, all sorts of different kinds of people. But they're definitely not people who know how to build walls. And so the question obviously is, well, why me? Why here? Why now? And the answer is, if not you, then who? 
If not now, then when? Now's the time for us to be unstoppable. And so the folks start working on what's exactly in front of them. And that's why Nehemiah makes a big deal about the professions, because you hear Malchijah the goldsmith didn't just build what was in front of his house, but he kept going. He was so dedicated to work. This guy who's probably upper middle class and sells jewelry for a living, who does fine work with his fingers, got in the game and threw his back into it and started pushing a wheelbarrow. Because something needed to be done. The wall had been torn down for years before these people came along and said, I'm going to do something. We are no longer going to live in ruins. We're going to build. We're going to be unstoppable. And the reason you pay attention to what's in front of you isn't just that it's in front of you. It's also that your neighbors are going to know, right? That section of wall is in front of Kyle's house. If Kyle does a bad job for generations, we're all going to remember it was Kyle. Kyle really didn't feel like working hard most of the time. You're building something and it's going to last really matters. Likewise, if you don't build the wall really well and somebody chooses to attack the wall, if you're the weak spot, that's where they're going to go. So they're going to, the per- first people who are going to be attacked is you, right on the other side of the wall. It matters, actually, that we focus on what's in front of us. And so these people begin to really focus and throw their backs into work really hard the same way that you and I are called to do that. And a crazy thing happens, the kind of thing that Christians say all the time, that if we love people really well in the name of Jesus, if we work hard, the world changes. It's a crazy thing that we believe, but if you love well and deeply, if you're committed to the kingdom of God, little by little, the world changes, brick by brick. The thing right in front of you is something that probably God has put in front of you. Sometimes in life, when you find that there's this problem that you see that really frustrates you and breaks your heart, and you don't know why it doesn't bother other people, in the same way you go, God, what's the deal? Like, why aren't you solving this problem? The answer that probably will come to you in prayer is, why do you think I made you? Who do you think is, is going to solve that problem? That's, that's exactly what I've built you to do, and it's exactly why you're so bothered by it. You have the gifts and the skills and the, know, the, the know-how, even if you don't think that you do. And these people who have no idea how to work with stones slowly and steadily do manage to build a wall. But the story continues at the beginning of chapter 4. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. He mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said that stone wall they're building, any fox going up on it would break it down. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt. Do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall. And all the wall was joined together to have its height, for the people had a mind to work. So it's not long into this impossible project that people don't know how to do and are in no way trained to do that they begin to succeed, which is amazing. And then pretty quickly, people start mocking and insulting them. Sanballat and Tobiah, who we've talked about a little bit, these guys are just jerks. They're just obnoxious, terrible human beings who don't like this project simply because it's happening. They don't want to see things fixed and restored. They don't want to see the status quo change. That's it. They have no other motivation. The deeper you drill down, the more terrible they sound. They are just jerks. And so they start heckling people who are actually doing a pretty brave and difficult thing. And that is something that you should probably be aware of. Even when the situation is impossible, even if you manage to start diving into it, don't think that you will be unopposed. Prepare actually to defend yourselves, because that's what's coming. This is one of the, the tools and tricks of the enemy. And by the enemy, I don't mean left or right. By the enemy, we, we don't mean de- Democrat or Republican, you know the enemy. We're not talking about masked or unmasked. We're not talking about COVID idiots or progressives or whatever it is that you might want to call people out there in the world. We always have one enemy. It's the devil. And I know that sounds superstitious in the time that we live in. And in a way, I suppose Christians are a little bit superstitious in that we believe the devil exists. We believe that there is more to evil than simply human decisions in the world, that there is a malevolent force in the world that is bent on destruction just because it enjoys destroying things. 
and it is often underneath human evil and decisions. Which doesn't mean that they're not responsible for their choices, it just means that the problem actually goes deeper than you realize. And you and I remember that we are always against the enemy. And that human enemies are not really our problem. In fact, those are people we're trying to save from the grip of the enemy. And one of the things you have to do as somebody who follows Jesus, you need to learn to recognize the voice of the enemy, his tricks and his moves, in order that you can see them for what they are and then ignore them. Because that's what happens in this story. Nehemiah sees it and doesn't engage. He hears it for what it is. He says, God, that's your problem. My problem is the wall. These people are not my problem. They're your problem. My problem is the wall. That's exactly what you do when you hear people mock and insult the work that we need to do. By the way, if you want to do really difficult things in the world, if you want to get engaged with any of the problems we're talking about in our life, be prepared for the enemy to mock and insult you. And actually to play on your insecurities, because that's absolutely what happens here. If you're trying to revive something in your marriage because things seem pretty hard right now, be prepared for your insecurities to be things that seem capitalized on in a way that you can't quite understand. If you're trying to deal with your coworkers and it just always seems contentious and you're really working hard actually to build bridges. If you're trying to find ways to talk to people about Jesus and you always seem to be opposed and other people in your life seem to be against you, even some Christians, strangely enough. If you're finding ways to love people in the name of Jesus and some people have a problem with it just because you're doing it, they seem to mock the idea of what you think that just loving people in the name of Jesus changes the world, recognize that for the voice of the enemy. These people, right, they're, you know, goldsmiths and merchants and pastors, I mean, all kinds of folks building the wall. And it's, what, what do these idiots think that they're doing? I mean, that's, that's the answer. What do they, like, they think they're going to build a wall in a day? Don't they realize how big a problem this is? Of course they do. Of course they're already thinking about how big a problem this is. They're just trying to focus on what's in front of them. They're trying to break their focus. That's what the enemy is doing. Do, do they think they're going to, what, fix the stones out of, out of rubble and rubbish? When the wall was built in the first place by Solomon and others, right? they had economic power, they had engineers, they had masons, they had the right kind of people working on this. And that wall still wasn't enough to keep out their enemies. And now what, you're going to use the same materials that have been ripped and broken down, that show evidence that they've been destroyed, and inexpert labor is somehow going to build a better wall? These people are already thinking that. And the basic idea is this, that there's no possibility of redemption. There's no possibility of restoration. That God isn't good enough, that God isn't big enough, and that you aren't really going to work hard enough to get this done. It's a lie. From the pit of hell, but it's easy to believe. And particularly in our time where we have short attention spans and where it's just exhausting and we're already feeling the fatigue and the malaise and the just monotony of COVID where you wake up and you think, I can't believe that I have to do this again today. And it would be so much easier to just go on my smartphone where, by the way, people are spending 3.1 hours a day on average, which is one quarter of our waking lives. I'm just going to tune out. I'm going to dive into unhealthy behaviors. I'm going to eat my emotions. I'm going to drink my emotions. I'm going to go on the internet and look at things that make me just feel better. And instead, we're called to get engaged. The question, by the way, that he asks, will they sacrifice? You and I hear that and we go, what does he mean? Like, will they give up meals? Are they going to, like, lose some sleep? And don't get me wrong, these guys are sacrificing. That's just not what the word means in this time. They are giving up their livelihoods. They are losing sleep. They are working really hard and throwing out their backs. People who, you know, usually work with gold are now doing something that isn't making them any money. But when he says, will they sacrifice, what he's really asking is, do they think they're just going to pray a wall into existence? Is that what they think they're going to do? Because the word sacrifice in the ancient world always refers to prayer. It's when you kill an animal and you light it on fire because God loves a barbecue. And I think we've gotten far, far too far away uh, from our ancient Israelite roots and the delicious work of prayer. God loves ribs, and I love ribs, and that's a good way to talk to the Lord. That's just exactly what God says in the entire book of Leviticus. And so he's asking, do you really think you're going to pray, and that's going to do things? And Nehemiah's response, he prays, and he gets back to work. He will not be distracted from this difficult work that needs to be done. The people working will not be distracted from the difficult work that needs to be done. They recognize the voice of the enemy, 
and they ignore it. They are unstoppable. Nelson Mandela, who was the first black president of South Africa, who was a warrior against apartheid, which was actually systemic racism, uh, who was a remarkable human being in just about every way, who didn't just fight against white folks, but actually fought for the unity of his nation, uh, was a man who also was frequently imprisoned for being black and went through many struggles along the way. And there was a poem over the years that he held very much the same way that I hold prayer. And he would repeat it to himself every day. Every day in prison, he'd say it out loud. The name of the poem is Invictus, which is a Latin word that means unconquerable, unstoppable, indomitable. And it sounds like this. Out of the night that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms, but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. I am unconquerable, he says at the end of the poem, because of the soul that I've been given by the gods. Now, you and I know who that God is and what exactly he's done in and through us. And Nehemiah, he prays and he gets back to work. And the truth is, he's this odd combination of spiritual and practical. He seems to see spiritual as practical and practical as spiritual throughout the book. He teaches us a really good way of being Christians in but not of the world. The story continues, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arab and the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And all plotted to come together to fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. So we prayed to our God and we set a guard as protection against them day and night. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing. There's too much rubbish so that we're unable to work on the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see anything before we come across them and kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us ten times, from all the places where they live, they will come up against us. So in the lowest parts of the spaces behind the wall, in the open places, I stationed people according to their families, with their swords and their spears and their bows. After I looked these things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight Fight for your kin and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that their plot was known to us and that God had frustrated it, we all returned from the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half my servants worked on the construction, half held spears, shields, bows, body armor, and the leaders posted themselves behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. The burden bearers carried the loads in such a way that each labored on the wall with one hand and the other held his weapon. They pray and they get back to work pray and they get back to work. They pray and they get back to work. When they come to Nehemiah afraid because they hear that their enemies are not satisfied just with insults and mockery, that they're actually going to come and kill some people. He says, all right, so we'll get back to work, but we'll bring swords with us. He says, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember that we're not in this alone, that we're not purely physical beings and we're not purely spiritual beings. I have people in my life who are amazing at prayer and they shame me accidentally just by being great at it. And it makes me want to be better and better and better at prayer. But I also have people in my life who I know who love to pray and seem very uninterested in like the material world in which we live. I'll pray for that person, and they might actually, you know, need me to buy them lunch. I'll pray for that person, but they're in the hospital, and maybe the doctors would be really helpful. You know, that's, you know, the only thing that matters to me is the spiritual side of things. And I... I think it's good to pray. Don't get me wrong at all. But God also gave us brains and hearts and hands and legs and backs and expects us to get some work done in the world. He actually commands us to do some things in the world. So that, you know, when we see hungry and naked people, that we don't say, well, I'll pray for you. We say, I'll pray for you. And by the way, here's some clothes and some food. Likewise, I know some people who have a remarkable work ethic an amazing work ethic in their life. They Again, they accidentally shame me just by being so good at it. And I'll see them live their lives and I'm like, man, that's just so practical. And then I also know some other people who are practical and they go, I don't really need to pray. What I need to do is focus and I need to get some stuff done. 
And that's true, and it's a really good thing. But the problem is if you live in a purely physical world, then it's really all on you. So anything that goes wrong is really your fault. And anything that seems impossible and beyond you is actually impossible and beyond you. And the amazing thing we believe as Christians is actually that we are physical and spiritual beings that we are absolutely responsible for what's in front of us, and yet that there's this great and mighty and awesome God who is behind us. And so when we hear fight for yourselves, for your neighbors, for your homes, for your kindred, for your city, fight for those who do not know Jesus yet, fight for those who are experiencing serious injustice in the world, fight for those who are dying of the coronavirus, fight in a world that seems to be tearing itself apart, fight for unity, fight for peace, fight for the gospel, fight for the kingdom of God. We know that we are not fighting alone, Jesus will literally tell us, look, you are part of the kingdom of God and I'm founding it on this. And I got to tell you, the gates of hell won't stand against it. That we are literally unstoppable if we pray and we get back to work. And so these people, they become warriors and do not imagine that they are soldiers. These are the same pastors and therapists and second grade teachers and farm workers and sanitation workers and goldsmiths as before. They suddenly became masons, and now they're soldiers. And you got to be thinking, I'm holding my sword in one hand and my trowel in the other, and I didn't know how to use either of these things like a week ago, but apparently now I'm this mighty warrior and this amazing construction worker. Oh, God, help me. And so they, they pray, and they get back to work, and they're constantly reminded they don't know what to do. In fact, they're out of their depth, that the times are terrible, and that God is with them. And an amazing thing happens because this extremely unintimidating group of people somehow intimidates their enemies. And not only do they intimidate their enemies, they manage to complete the work on the wall. And the story continues. They go to sleep in their clothes, they wake up every day, they're working hard at this. But it's amazing, actually, what they manage to accomplish in some impossible and ridiculous times, really because they're unstoppable and they're working together and they're, they're praying and focusing on what's in front of them. So they know the voice of the enemy and they won't listen to it. Uh, there's this church many years ago uh, in England has an inscription on it, Leicester. The inscription recalls the life of the man who, uh, during the laying of the church's enduring stones, well, it reads as follows. In the year 1653, when all things sacred were profaned throughout the nation, either demolished or profaned. Uh, so in 1653, when things in your country were going really, really badly, and especially sacred and holy things were being destroyed or treated like they weren't holy. Sir Robert Shirley, baronet, did found this church. Robert Shirley started this church. And his singular praise it is to have done the best of things in the worst of times and hoped them in the most calamitous. His singular praise is that he did the best of things in the worst of times. That's the thing you can say about this guy. He did the best he possibly could, and the times were horrible. And the, the more calamitous things got, the more he hoped that God would do great things. You and I are called to live as though there really is a God in the midst of this pandemic, to focus on what's in front of us, to be people who fight for God's justice in a world that does not seem at all interested in. And to know that when we pray, we're not alone. To know that when we get back to work, that we're not alone. To know that when we fight, that we're not alone. That even if you feel completely out of your depth and you don't really know what to do with any of the things in your hands, that you can actually do the best of things in the worst of times. That you can be unstoppable. Because our God is unstoppable. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you.